Okay, so I want to thank the organizers for asking me to speak here today. And the past two talks have actually kind of set me up for um, why we're doing these projects. Um, so about 10 years ago, the Genome Reference Consortium was formed primarily to identify problems in the reference and then start um, to address them. Um, this group is made up of four different um, institutes. The Sanger Institute, along with McDonald Genome Institute, primarily do the wet lab work. And then EBI and NCBI are our bioinformatics component of the project. And then more recently, uh, ZFIN, which is a zebrafish um, group, has also joined the Genome Reference Consortium. So um, I'm going to show you first an example of how a problem in the reference can uh, confound your mapping data, especially if you're using short read technology. So um, a false duplication was found in the reference, and unfortunately, this still exists in GRC H38. But it was found by multiple groups, and actually, one of the groups was working on a project at MGI. So we have kind of uh, come up with a fix for it internally. But basically, it, an, exact bleh, an exact duplication was found of the U2A F1 gene. And because of this, uh, the read mapping data through the region was not the way it was expected to be. So um, we had a lot of samples where the read mapping was a problem. So basically, this duplication, once we prove that it was a false duplication and should not actually be there, um, the mapping coverage then improved from that uh, data. What we did to fix it was basically mask that region of the reference. So here is some of the mapping coverage from that uh, project. And this is just showing that original U2AF1 gene. In this top panel, you can see, I don't know how many of you are familiar with IGV, but basically it's short read alignments um, to the reference. And the top panel is the reference uh, version that contains the problem, contains the duplicated gene. So these blank. Um, mappings here show, are basically showing that uh, the mapping is incorrect or that it's a duplication where the mapping is going to multiple places and the software is not sure how to call um, SNPs in that area. So after the, the duplicated region was removed from the reference, you can actually see that the mapping looks the way it should. Um, so removing that duplicated sequence in this instance fixed the mapping results. This shows that second region um, of the reference that should not have been there, the, how the mapping looked in that region. And once we removed it, um, then there's, there's nothing there. So obviously, it corrects the mapping of the data. Basically, when you're doing short read mapping, if there's no true location for that read to go to, or there are multiple regions for that read to go to, the mapping will be a problem. So this actually points out a good, um, this is a good example of why the Genome Reference Consortium was formed. Um, there are places like this that needed to be fixed. And then the other side of this is that there's lots of diversity out there that is not included in the reference, you know, and that was uh, talked about earlier. Um, so our key goal in the project that I'm going to talk about um, is to add diversity to the reference. So as I mentioned, the current reference, it's still a work in progress. It is one linear representation. There are places where there are multiple alleles represented, but for the most part across the reference, it's the one representation of one genome. So it's not necessarily optimal for all individuals, and there are some ethnicities that are not uh, represented at all. So even though 38 was comprised of DNA from multiple individuals. About 70% of the reference sequence is from one individual. So there are private alleles, there are errors, there are things that basically need to be fixed with additional sequence. 
So um, as well, we found that the allelic diversity, when we created the reference, when you go from one allele to another, if the alleles are not the same, you know, if there is variation in those two alleles, you end up not being able to make joins and you actually have data that is incorrect in some instances. But the, the human genome was completed or deemed complete in 2003. And since then, there's been a lot of technology improvements to where we can actually add data at a reasonable cost um, and time frame. So we've been able to make substantial improvements to the reference genome. But even with this, it was decided that there were additional high quality reference genomes that were needed to accurately reflect the diversity in the human genome. So about, I think, five or six years ago, we started this project where we were going to sequence whole uh, genomes. Initially, our goal was to sequence five genomes, and we're using Coriel samples. Um, they're part of the 1,000 genome sample collection at Coriel. Um, well, on this slide, I'm showing, I think, eight genomes that we had sequenced at the time that I made this, but we're basically up to 28 currently, and we are part of the initiative that Maggie mentioned, so there will be a lot more to come. So our initial sequencing plan was to generate deep coverage of PacBio reads, long reads, um, as long as the technology would allow at the time. We generated about 60x coverage. We would do a de novo assembly of just that data. And then we would use um, various types of data to scaffold. We've primarily used bio nano data. We've looked a little bit at 10x and HiC data as well to do our scaffolding. And then in the very beginning of the project, we um, had generated some back libraries uh, for some of the samples to actually sequence repetitive regions in a smaller context. Because you know, if you have a whole genome, it's harder to assemble the repetitive regions. So this is the list of submitted assemblies that we have now. These are all um, contig assemblies currently. And for the most part, they've not been incorporated into the reference yet, but that is our goal. Um, so any of these are available at GenBank that you can download. Um, and then the first three are actually uh, chromosome level assemblies um, that you can download as well. And these are the current genomes that are underway. Uh, most of them are in our assembly assessment pipeline, which does involve aligning those sequences to BioNano um, to verify the assembly process. So um, this pipeline is changing um, lately, but this is the a uh, pipeline that has primarily been used for the data that uh, was already submitted. We would use um, Falcon to generate an assembly for that PacBio data. Um, and generally, we would use a standard set of parameters, but one of the things with the PacBio data that we've generated, because we've generated over so long of a period, the data um, quality has changed, the amount of data is not always the same that we've generated. We've, we've uh, geared towards getting at least 70x coverage, but in some instances we would end up with more. So basically then you can tweak a few parameters and actually get um, potentially a better assembly. So we would generate multiple assemblies for each data set, pick what we think is the best one, which is a little bit subjective, and then we would move on to the error correction process. So Quiver is used or was used at the time with this data set to uh, correct using PacBio reads, so it error corrects the consensus of the data. And then Pylon uses Illumina data to error correct as well. Um, and those are the polishing steps that we do. With newer data sets that are generated uh, on the SQL instrument, we use a process called Aero if we're using Falcon to assemble. And then we would actually use BioNano to align to that uh, sequence assembly. It's the exact same sample, so they should match 100%. Well, they're not, they don't. 
Um, and in this process, we're able to identify chimeric contacts. So generally, there'll be a few contacts that are joined at some of those duplications that um, were spoke about earlier. And then this is our way to identify those and break them. And then we submit those contacts to NCBI. So here's an example of one of those breakpoints in the, uh, one of the first assemblies that we worked on. And at the top here is our um, PAC bio contig. So in this instance, it's not the reference, but it's actually our assembly that we generated with PAC bio data. And then this is um, alignment to uh, two bio nano contigs from that exact same sample. So the bars in red here, it's kind of difficult to see, but this part of this contig does not align. This part in green does align very well to this PAC bio contig. And then um, it, the opposite is true on this contig where this portion aligns well to the PAC bio contig. And this portion in red does not. One of the things that you'll notice is that the point where they both start to diverge is the same. So when we do sequence alignments of this exact PAC bio contig, one of the things that you'll notice, so this is chromosome one in this top panel, um, GRCH38, and this is the sequence alignment of that uh, PAC bio contig. The places where there are red and gray bars are the alignment, and then this, from this point on, they no longer align. This is that same PAC bio contig aligned chromosome four, the first portion of that contig does not align to chromosome four, but the second portion does. So one of the things that you'll notice that is um, something that both two speakers previous to me talked about was the duplication in the region. So this is a duplication that is found on chromosome one and chromosome four, and it's such that the length of the PAC bio reads are not longer than the duplication, so Falcon kind of gets mixed up when it's putting the reads together and basically smash these two regions together. So this is um, fairly common in our assemblies. I mean, usually depending on the assembly and the actual read length that we have for each of these genomes, we get anywhere from 30 to 40 to over, 100 and, over 140 for this genome um, that were identified as uh, translocations or chimeras. Um, and then actually we uh, look at that data, align the sequence data to the reference and try and determine whether we think the sequence assembly should be broken or not. Some of those, there's not enough evidence, so we don't break them. Um, but quite a few of them, we do end up breaking, and we have much better assemblies because of it. So here's just a, a smattering of samples that we've sequenced to give you an idea of the contig in 50s. So, you know, because we are sequencing these genomes to get as complete data sets as possible. We want um, the genome size to be, uh, you know, as close to perfect as possible. So we're usually uh, assembling around 2.8 gigs of the genome for each of these samples. And again, this is primarily RS2 data, so it's fairly old. Our contig numbers at the time of those assemblies were around 3,000 contigs that are included in that total assembly. And then our contig in 50 numbers are around 20 megs. But you will notice that on the last two lines here, so this genome is much uh, shorter contig in 50 links. And this was our first SQL only. So this was when SQL first came out. This was our first SQL only genome. And the read links were much smaller than what we were achieving with the RS2. And then the, the bottom genome was actually a combination of the two data sets, so it's not as good as we typically would get. Um, so the other way that we use BioNano to improve our data is actually to scaffold our PAC bio assemblies. So once we have run um, the alignment to validate that our PAC bio assemblies don't have any more chimeras, we will actually use it um, to do scaffolding as well. 
So this shows you how the two technologies are very complementary to one another. Frequently, um, the bio-nano data will uh, help us join and make our genomes much more contiguous. So here's a chart that shows the contig lengths. So the contig N50 of the PAC bio assemblies is shown in blue here. Um, and you can see that they're all around, the scale is in the megabase scale. So they're all around 20 megabases roughly um, for the assembly alone. Then when you actually look at the sapphire map that we generated, they're somewhere in between the 50 to 60 megabase range just for the sapphire map contigs. And then when you combine the two data sets, you get upwards of 70 megabases um, as far as contig lengths go. So the other thing we kind of look at, at um, how complete the genome is and how many contigs it's in. So this is also showing the contig number, also in blue, the PAC bio uh, assemblies. And on this slide, I actually have some newer data. So these are some of the newer data sets where we have SQL 2, uh, maybe it's SQL 1 data that actually has been improved um, since those first two genomes that I were on the previous slide. But basically, you can see how the contig uh, number has gone down as the read length has gone up. Um, and then, so also, oops the bio nano contig number, and then the scaffold number. It's very difficult to see, but the scaffold of these data sets, the numbers are less than 200. So basically anywhere from 150 scaffolds to around 200 scaffolds to represent the entire um, genome for these data sets. So bio nano is very useful in this, in this way for us. So, one of the um, ways that we have used the PAC bio assemblies um, is to assess the gaps that are present in the reference. Um, at one point, when we went from GRC H37 to 38, we added um, some whole genome contexts. Uh, but at the time that those data sets were uh, mostly from short read sequencing, so the contigs are very small. Um, and in our assessment, we actually would call this gap just uh, one gap. So just to kind of clarify my numbers here. So when I, when I count it like that, going from clone to clone, there's 196 gaps total. And this is ignoring the centromere gaps because hopefully my PAC bio assemblies did not cross the centromeres because um, I would not believe that. Um, there are eight assemblies that um, we assessed for this, and of those eight assemblies, 26 of these 196 gaps were actually spanned by all of the whole genome assemblies in exactly the same way. So this is probably a factor of sequencing an entire whole genome and being able to get really long reads. You can span these gaps um, better than what you could with the clones, because the back clones that are primarily used for the um, reference are, could be biased. So some of these regions just were not present in those back clones. So there were um, three gaps that were spanned by all um, of the eight assemblies, but they're varying sizes. So these are places where, these are interesting places to us, because one of the things that we want to do is represent as much variation as possible. So there's variation present in these gaps that we can now represent. And um, there were 24 of the gaps that were spanned by some of the WGS assemblies, but not all of them. So again, those could be places where there is variation present um, in those assemblies that uh, is not present in the reference. So one of the ways that we initially identified these regions was to compare um, the bio nano assemblies that we generated of that sample to the reference. So here is an example of a standard gap in uh, GRCH38. Basically, if we didn't know the size of the gap, uh, we would mark it as the 50 kb gap. 
So one of the things that we found when looking at some of these samples, and this is the um, this is the this top track here or the middle track here is the PAC bioassemblies aligned to the reference. You'll see that there's these red lines. This means that there that sequence is not present. Well, it's basically ends, so there shouldn't be sequence there that aligns. But there is a, a small tick here that actually indicates that there is sequence that does belong there. Um, and that was also identified by BioNano as SVs across each of these maps. So in all four assemblies for our BioNano data, the BioNano called it an SV basically because it's a large gap and in reality it really should be very small. Um, so the, these are things that we can improve and close in the next assembly. So this just gives you a general idea of how many SVs we have in some of these assemblies, the BioNano databases compared to the reference. Um, you know, there's quite a few uh, different SVs and SV types. So uh, this is filtered just by quality, but there are ways that we can filter it to get more meaningful data. So one of the things that, was, um, that we realized when looking at the BioNano data that we had run the haplotype aware assembly on is whenever you separate the alleles in, the, in an assembly, you actually find more information. So a lot of our initial sequence assemblies are collapsed. So there's two alleles that we sequence, but then when we assemble it, we end up collapsing the data into one consensus. So that is not necessarily ideal, and this example shows you that. Um, this is CYP2D, CYP2D6 region. It's a, a gene that is, um, is involved in drug metabolism, so it is a very interesting region, and it is very um, variable among individuals. So one of the things that we noticed when we looked at this region in the BioNano map is compared to the reference, this allele contains an insertion. And then when we look at the second allele, it also contains an insertion, but it's a different kind of insertion or a different sized insertion. So in this sample in particular, um, this allele, these two alleles are not present in the reference. And this again, when you're doing short read mapping, is very critical to have this data there. If you had short reads from 12878 and you were looking at this region in particular, if it does not exist in the reference, you're not gonna get short reads mapped to that region. So this is one of the, reason, one of the main reasons that we found that we really need to add additional allelic diversity to the reference. So another thing that you can do um, that I believe Mark and Alex both talked about is that you can do the variant annotation pipeline. So we ran that on the reference sequences and to identify places that don't typically occur in the 200-ish um, samples that exist in the BioNano database of controls. So this is an example, uh, the Mendy assembly, that one of the Mendy assemblies that we have where there's a, a rare insertion. This is actually found in none of the um, data sets that are in the BioNano control data set, but it could, it could be something interesting. So these are things that we're looking at in more detail. So along with that, we are trying to do our assemblies in a better way so that we do represent both alleles in the assembly process. We are starting to look at trio canoe. It's a, a way to bin data if you have a full trio. So most of our samples have uh, parental uh, cell lines that we can get from Coriel. So we can actually generate some uh, minimal amount of data from the parents. And then by, by, uh, by doing that sequence, comparing that sequence of the parental data, you can actually bin the pack bio reads or, or any long reads um, into kind of a maternal and paternal uh, group 
and then you do two independent assemblies. So you'll get all of the maternal alleles and all the paternal alleles in two separate assemblies. And it's a good way to identify and have more complete genomes. The problem that we're running into right now is that the contig in 50 is a lot less contiguous than um, what we're used to seeing. But if we want to separate those genomes right now, this is one of the best um, methods to do it. Um, and we're still working on, we've only done a few genomes so far, but we are still going back. And for the genomes that we have full trios, we are going to try and generate these assemblies as well. So as Maggie mentioned, the Human Pan Genome Reference Program was just announced, uh, I believe it was the last few weeks. Um, and we are part of it. There's the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium, which will include national as well as international pan genome efforts. And the funding components so far are the Human Pan Genome Reference Center, which we are a part of, and then the Human Pan Genome Re uh, Sequencing Center, which um, we are also a component of. There are still some components in this big program that are to be awarded, and they have more to do with um, the reference representation. So once we generate more references, what are we going to do with them? Um, there are some tools that are being developed as well as sequen sequencing technology development. And this is a very busy slide, but this is kind of the organization so far of this large consortium that's working on uh, this project. So WashU and UCSC and EBI are key in both of these projects that have been funded so far. So the goals of the consortium quickly are to produce 350 whole genome assemblies. And we are using many technologies to sequence and assemble the genomes, uh, BioNano included. Our goal will be to have fully phased diploid assemblies. We will identify the SVs between the samples and the current reference. And then at some point, we will likely switch to some sort of graph representation to represent all of these different variables um, in the references. So in summary, we are still sequencing a few more genomes as part of that original project, but then shortly we will start working on the 350. Um, we are trying to find better assembly methods so that we can represent all the variation that exists in those samples in a way that can actually be used. Um, and then hopefully those will be incorporated into the reference at some point, as well as in the future, a new reference type, likely some sort of graph. Um, what my group in particular really needs to work on is a QC pipeline that is more streamlined than what we have right now, because what we do is very manual. And we, we've done 30-ish genomes in five years, and I think we're going to have to do 350 in five years. So we need to speed up our process for sure. And here are the many people that have worked on the project up to date. And this slide will be very large compared, compared to what it is now um, in the future, because there's a lot more groups that are going to start working on this. Um, and that is it. And I'll take questions. <laughs>